Okay, so let's talk about threat intelligence here. STIX and TAXI are the, are the protocols used for sharing threat intelligence information. So STIX is here, and if we go to here, the website from Oasis telling you about STIX, STIX is the structured language to store information, and TAXI is the transport mechanism to harvest that information based on HTTP. So, uh, for example, you can see a STIX file here. And let's just open this one live. Here's a STIX file, and it is just a structured JSON file. So here you see it's got creation dates and so on. This is a malicious site hosting a downloader, and here's a description of it. This organized threat actor group operates to create profit and so on. Here is the URL, http x 4 z 9 arbcn 4712 So the main information is this is a malicious URL. And you have some information about it being malicious, something about the time, and uh, so on. And down here you have a relationship between two things, an indicator connected to some malware. So this is malware types, backdoor remote trojan. So we have an object here called a indicator. And you are indicators of compromise are what you typically call them. There's also indicators of attack. An indicator of attack is something which if you find it means they're attacking you. An indicator of compromise is something if you find it that means they have actually taken over that server. Uh, and so you have an indicator would be the presence of traffic to this URL and you have malware, descriptions of different possible malware, and you have a relationship which is that that indicator goes to that malware. So that's what this thing is. It's just a structured machine readable way of storing that kind of information. And there's a visualizer, which is bloody awesome here. So if you go to this visualizer, this will give you a viewable image from any STIX data you feed in. And we can get the STIX data from here, for example. Here is STIX data. So we can put it in here and fetch. And now you have a graphic description of that. You have the back door and the malicious site hosting the downloader. If you click, and here's the indicator connecting the two. This indicates that. So when you go, and if you click on this, it should show more details and it's showing up down there. Let me shrink this a little bit or make my window wider and we'll. There we are. Now it shows up on the right, easier to see. So there's indicator and malware. If I click on the indicator, I should see here more information about it. Here's the selected node appearing down here. Indicator, just laying out the information with the pattern. And here's the malware. And um, if I get to the bottom, it tells you that information about the malware. So that's the simplest case to show you what the visualizer can do. And there are some funner ones. So now, here's a threat actor. So let's examine this one. All right. So now we have an adversary Bravo with a poison ivy variant. And here's adversary Bravo and phishing. This one is the threat actor. This one is that person's identity. Because right, you may not know who the threat actor is. They actually have the identity for this one. If you click on that and go down here, they actually have some description of the identity. Looks like they don't have this person's actual name, although sometimes they do. And here you got their name as a threat actor, which looks like it's pretty much the same thing in this case. Here's the Poison Ivy variant, which tells you part of the Mandiant life cycle model and so on. And the phishing technique, which uh, is here spear phishing used as a method. So again, simple enough. Nothing too exciting there. But now we get to the real fun one, which is APT1. This is the original APT that hacked Google, that started the whole world of advanced persistent threat, and Mandiant wrote all kinds of information about it. And all that information has been placed in this format. So, didn't work it. Okay, I must have copied the wrong thing. Yeah, I get lost. Okay. Right click, copy. See if I can paste in here without getting in trouble. Paste. There we are. Fetch. There we are. That giant mess is 
APT1. Many, many things. The Communist Party of China, some MD5 hashes, some uh, missions, some H-Tran hot point accessor, and so on. The actual people here, like Jack Wang. And you can move people around. You can drag them here to make it easier. So here's Jack Wang. That's going to be the actual identity of somebody. Government individual, ugly gorilla at 163.com. They actually have their IP address. And you know, this is how ultimately they had like a warrant put out for the arrest of the individual people for doing this, some of this stuff. So here's some tools they use like PW dump and GSEC dump. So PW dump is one of the many password harvesting tools, dumps passwords from the Windows registry and so on. You can uh, just get a ton of information here in a structured way and go through it in this viewer. And there are some flags to find. So that's the joy of sticks. That's what sticks can do. Now, Taxi is the exchange protocol used to do this. And you can just do taxi requests with curl. And so this I can do, for example, on my Mac. I can just do it directly from the command line. Although I've got a Linux machine set up, I guess I'll just use that. This is a headless Linux machine. Let's uh, um, all right. clear. All right, so I've got curl. So if I do this, this is going to go to halataxi.com, which is an open source you know, service available for this. And the first thing you do is you run the taxi discovery service. And what this will do is tell you what taxi requests are available. And there are some headers, application, and uh, here this is called a discovery request in this XML format. So you can do it with curl. Oh, I got to install curl. Okay, fine. sudo apt install curl. Thought I'd already done that on this machine, but anyway. All right. Now I can repeat that. OK, so it sends a request to halataxi.com. And I'm getting no reply. That's rude. <laughs> right. Let's see if halataxi.com is just down or something. That will foul this up. It's not down. Well, ah, there it answered. It was just kind of slow. OK. And the response is a blob of unreadable XML, painful to look at, difficult to understand. All right. So it'd be better if you use burp. So let me put burp on here. And I'm going to use my host machine for this. It'll be easier. Burp makes it easier. There are many ways to do this, but burp is the proxy used by uh, web pen testers, and it's the one I'm used to using. All right. You could use Postman 2 for this, but uh, Burp is more familiar, so I've used that. So here's my Burp. OK. So this is the Burp proxy. And I go to Proxy, Turn Off Intercept. And now I open, uh, let me check what I got to have here. OK, I got to have, um, yeah, I got to go for a gateway address. Uh, actually, I can probably do it here. We're going to try it from the Linux machine just because I started there. I might have to move to my host. Let's do trace route 1.1.1.1. OK, and so it goes to 172.16.123.2. Let's see if I can listen on that address. If I go to my options and adjust the listening address, 172.16.123.1, this might work and it might not work. We're going to see. I'll say OK. And now I'll see if I can send to that address. I think I can. Let's see if I can ping that address. And I can. OK, so I can redirect traffic to go to that address. So I'm going to uh, 
add that to my request, I put this minus x at the end. Good, it's even got the right address because I recorded this for my same machine. Life is good. So now you take the same request and you run it through the proxy instead. And that is here. Okay, and now if I look in the proxy, I should be able to see the request here and the reply in a nice formatted structure. So there's the request and here's the response and it's a lot prettier in burp so you can read it more easily which is the only point of what we're doing now although we are going to use burp to make it easier. So now you see I've sent a discovery request here. It changes the color to purple to make it easier to read. And here's the discovery response and so you see I have various things available to me here. I have a discovery service which is what I just used. I have a collection management service and I have a poll service. And collection management, I think, is what you use to upload data, which I'm not going to do. Poll is what I'm going to use, where you get data from these services. All right. And so then, yeah, collect, okay, collection management is to see what data feeds are available, not to populate them. I had that wrong. So we are going to use all three of these. So now we've done discovery to see what services are available. Now we're going to do collection management to see what um, what fields are available. And what you're going to do is we're going to use burp repeater to make these. Now that we have a working request in burp, we can send it to the repeater. And we can work in this nice graphical environment instead of doing everything in the curl command line. So now I just need to make two changes here to make this um, I, correct. I need to change the folder name to taxi data which was in the reply from before. You'll find that up here. Here it tells you to do this. Uh, this one has to go to taxi data. That's why I had to change that. And I have to change the request to match that too, which is collection information request in line 10 here. Instead of discovery request, I put in collection information request. And now I send that. And here's the response. Uh, I'm waiting. Yep, a little bit slow. OK. And now I get the names of the threat intelligence feeds. Guest abuse, um, cybercrime tracker, em emerging threats with emerging spelled wrong, um, Lehigh edu, some kind of college thing, malware domain list, host list, and so on. There's a bunch of these. They don't all seem to be full of useful data anymore. Um, the one that works is guest.fishtank. Which is here. Guest.fishtank is available. So now that we know that, now we can um, pull from fish tank. So I'll make another copy of the original one here. Send to repeater. And now, um, oh, OK. I wanted to copy this one. Right click, copy to repeater. So I get the, uh, correct, um, the correct URL for the request, this uh, hailataxi.com. Now I just need to change the XML down here. And I have the XML here, the pull request. And this pull request asks for specific data. Now, if I ask for all of it, it'll be huge. So I'm asking for the data just in a very narrow time range, just in a period of 10 minutes in 2018. I just tried a bunch of times until I found a time range that had some interesting data without too much total data. So here, I put that in. Replace line 10 with this XML request. There. Now I send that. And I'm waiting. And it's done. And here's the response. And the response is still pretty big. But it's somewhat readable. And uh, so there's a flag to find. You'll find various things here in the response. Here's information. Um, Guest.fixtank in response to... And so here, 
um, something to be determined, unclassified public. Down here is a malicious URL with 440 kilometers in it. And here's information about it. it was identified by Fish Tank as part of a phishing email and so on as you go down. Here's another malicious URL, something about a smiley and so on. There's this long list. Now it's still not incredibly convenient, but you can see how it's machine readable and you're getting information from a live feed. So the next thing you can do after that, yeah, and I don't think I'll bother demonstrating it live, but um, this is the next steps. You can use Cabby. Now Cabby is a Python library to do this efficiently in command line in Python. So after you have Cabby, you can now do taxi discovery with the path and it will just give you the answer in a nice formatted thing without that ugly XML format, even prettier than it looked in Burp. So now you get the same information, discovery, collection management, and poll. And now you can do taxi collections and it will again give you a nicely formatted description of each one that without all the extra tags and stuff. And you can use grep to filter it. And then you just get a list of the names very nicely. And then you can pull fish tank. Again, you pull for the same 10 minute period. And now you'll get 136 blocks pulled. And you can use, you can redirect the output to a file and look at it in a file. And then you can use less and grep and so on to filter this. You can use a word count and sort and use unique values. You can use command line Unix tools to handle this data and get it down to just extracting the URL. So you end up with a, a structure where you cut with a delimiter of greater than to get part of it. And then you have a second cut with the other delimiter of this other square bracket. And by arranging it correctly, you can get just the, just the URLs with nothing else. So you can get a nice clean list of that 136 bad URLs, which is what you're going to want. You can put that in a file and there's some flags to find here. And then once you've got the script to harvest it from the server and get just the URLs, you can then configure a squid proxy to block those URLs. And this is essentially what your anti-malware products are doing. They're subscribing to an online feed, downloading the automatic data and then blocking it. And you can set up a squid proxy on a Linux machine so it will block those websites and it draws them. You can make a, you uh, configure it to use a bad sites.txt and you can load in the bad sites.txt from there. So there you get to see the whole process. And this is, of course, uh, what's going on in the background of your security tools and a good thing to understand. So that's what I wanted to show you.